Well, um, so I'm going to tell you about Cliff's work on the, the Weinstein conjecture in three dimensions. So let me set things up a little bit. Let's see. Um, so um, the, the Weinstein conjecture is about periodic orbits. And of course, um, the existence of periodic orbits is a basic uh, problem in dynamical systems. Um, And um, it, so I want to motivate where the Weinstein conjecture comes from a little bit. So of course, on a symplectic manifold, there's um, uh, given a function, there's a preferred vector field, Hamiltonian vector field. There it is. Uh, and um, its flow and local coordinates is the uh, usual Hamilton equations. Um, now that the flow of, of a Hamiltonian vector field preserves, um, preserves the level sets of, of the Hamiltonian. And so there's a, a, you know, a, an in industry of trying to find periodic orbits for uh, Hamiltonian vector fields. Um, and in the late 70s, uh, Paul Rabinowitz and, and Alan Weinstein proved um, a, a, a quite a, at the time, quite an important result. Sorry, I've got my pointer. Um, that if you have a <coughs> Hamiltonian in R2n, um, and you have, so Rabinowitz looked at the star shape case, and uh, Weinstein looked at the convex case, that the, you know, the interior of the, the sublevel set is either star shaped or convex, and you're looking at the induced flow on the boundary, and they proved that the corresponding flow, Hamiltonian flow, has a periodic orbit on that level set. So um, Weinstein was searching for a kind of unifying theme. Uh, and um, what he observed was that a contact structure could be uh, seen as responsible for the arguments to work. So <clears throat> remember, a contact structure is a, uh, a nowhere involutive hyperplane field in the tangent space, nowhere integrable in the sense of Frobenius. And um, <coughs> a contact structure determines a, a distinguished class of vector fields called Rabe vector fields. And they satisfy the two following two conditions. Um, the vector field is supposed to be transverse to Xi, and the flow is supposed to preserve the, the uh, hyperplanes. Um, by the way, the, the um, <coughs> um, how do I say it? Yeah, the context structure that appears in, 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 the, in the story there, in the Rabinowitz and, and the Weinstein stories, that if you take, um, take the standard primitive uh, of the symplectic form on R2n, so contracting with the radial vector field, its restriction gives you a one form whose kernel is a contact, um, uh, a contact distribution, contact plane field. Okay, so. Um, right, right. So a, a ray vector field and a contact structure, this plane field, is equivalent to a contact one form, which is a, a one form that satisfies the, these two conditions. Its value is one on the ray vector field, and it annihilates the uh, hyperplane field. And, and the, the uh, condition, condition that the <coughs> um, flow preserves the uh, contact planes implies that the contraction with the exterior derivative of the form is, is zero. And usually people start with the contact form and explain how that uh, gives you the ray vector field. These are you know, equivalent notions. The, the um, ray vector field and the contact one form. Okay, so, um, <coughs> right. right. So given the distribution, there's no local obstruction to existence of a, a vector field or one form, and globally, C must be co-orientable. So I'm going to introduce a little, bit of, um, a little bit of topology that starts to happen once you pick a contact one form. The first thing is that uh, contact structure um, determines a, an orientation, or I, maybe I should say a contact one form determines an orientation. Uh, the non-integrability is equivalent to the fact that this is a nowhere vanishing uh, 2n plus 1 form on our 2n plus 1 manifold, so it's an, it gives a preferred volume form. Um, 
And you notice that if n is odd, actually the orientation is independent of the sign. So we're mainly interested in the case where uh, we're on a three-dimensional manifold, so a, a contact one form determines an orientation. And if we need an orientation, we'll always uh, take that one. Oops. Um, if I have a, an oriented contact structure, then it has uh, a, an Euler class. We have this 2n plane field inside our 2n plus 1 manifold, and um, I'll call the Euler class um, k of c. So again, mainly we're interested in the n equals n equals one case, so three manifold, and there's a two-dimensional cohomology class. Okay, so um, so the Weinstein conjecture says that on any contact manifold y c, and for each ray vector field, um, there's a periodic orbit for the corresponding dynamical system. <coughs> um, yeah, so. This is, I mean, Weinstein posed the conjecture in any dimension, and there's been a huge amount of work in, in, uh, in many, in all dimensions, but I'm only gonna talk about the, the three-dimensional case. Um, and, yeah, so, um, you, you can think of this uh, as, as a variation on the theme of, of Arnold's uh, fixed-point conjecture, so, let me just put the, slide up here. Um, it, so I have this 2n plus 1 manifold, and if I um, take uh, a 2n dimensional submanifold that's transverse to the vector field, the uh, two form exterior derivative of the contact one form induces a symplectic form. So this thing, I this slice for this dynamical system, and um, of course, closed orbits correspond to fixed points. So, um, anyway, I just want to mention that. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> the Weinstein conjecture, you can also think of, I don't think this is what Weinstein had in mind, but it, as a, a way of uh, kind of resurrecting um, uh, Seifert's conjecture. So, Seifert asked in, in 1950, um, I stole a bunch of this from a, a paper of Hoffer, the history, by the way. So if the history is wrong, not my fault. <laughs> um, I checked the references, actually. It's okay. Uh, um, okay, so in 1950, uh, Seifert conjecture um, that every flow on the three sphere has a closed orbit. And in 74, uh, Schweitzer, uh, found a C1 vector field with no periodic orbit, then later this was improved to a C2 vector field, and then uh, uh, Christina Cooperberg in 1994 found a, actually a real analytic vector field. So um, is this just a point? Uh, uh, I wanna exhibit the fact that, that the contact condition is about as weak as you can ask to have a very general existence result for periodic orbits. So, um, <coughs> so there's no, general theorem, not every vector field. There are vector fields that don't have periodic orbits. And even, um, it's also false in the volume preserving case for C1 flows. That's joint work of Greg and Christina Cooperberg. So by the way, um, if the flow of a ray vector field preserves the volume form DA, A wedge DA, so it is volume preserving. Um, yeah. Oh, there we go. Right, good. Um, and it, it's also um, false that the sort of Hamiltonian version, there are level sets of Hamiltonians that don't have periodic orbits. Um, so, okay. So now the main subject is uh, <coughs> um, Taub's result. So a um, year ago, Taub proved the Weinstein conjecture in dimension three. Um, and in fact, it proves it giving some control over the homology class of, um, of the closed orbit. So you notice that, so I, I have this vector field, so if I have a closed orbit, it has a preferred orientation, the one induced by the, the vector field. So it makes sense to take, um, uh, if I have, um, <coughs> um, you know, 
it makes sense to talk about the homology class of a sum of closed orbits, because they each have preferred orientations, and I take their sum without ambiguity that way. So uh, Taub's main result is that if I have a uh, oriented uh, contact three manifold, then every homology class E, um, so that, um, yeah, this is going to be a cohomology class later, but anyway. So remember, um, there was this uh, canonical class of, of C. So, the Poinc so I look at its, that's a two-dimensional cohomology class. I look at its Poincaré dual. That's a one-dimensional homology class. And the condition is that uh, if the Poincaré dual of this thing plus twice the given homology class is a torsion class, then, um, then, the, then E is represented by a positive sum of closed uh, ray orbits. So in particular, um, <coughs> you know, it, so by the way, the canonical class it is, um, th this class is always divisible by two. So there is always an E so that, um, so that the hypothesis is satisfied so there are always closed orbits on, on every, um, for any contact structure on every three manifold. Okay. Um, so the three-dimensional case was the subject of a lot of work, and uh, the most important contributions prior to Taub's work were uh, due to Hofer. Yeah. So, okay. Anyway, um, all right. So, what what I want to you know before I actually get to the some of the, some of the details of the argument, I want to uh, explain that somehow. Um, the, the theme of Taub's result is that um, you know, three-manifold theory is a crowded place. There's not enough room for too many dis disconnected things to be going on. And um, the kind of, uh, um, you know, the people that are getting crowded in the room are floor homologies. So, um, the, so <coughs> we've learned since the uh, late 80s from the work of Floor that uh, in lots of, I mean, now lots of different ways, um, if I have a three manifold, I can associate to it a vector space called its Floor homology. And then I may have to have other adjectives, as I'll explain. Um, I mean, you need other adjectives to define it in some particular case. But, um, you know, so th this fits into the sort of, uh, somehow under the head of the idea of a topological field theory. Um, and um, it turns out that, you know, just as with, you know, in, in the early days of, of homology, there were lots of different definitions, and at the end of the day, they were all the same. So the, the real juice here is that the same thing is going on, but now they're sort of the uh, the players in the game are um, more interesting and sophisticated. They involve uh, heavy-duty use of PDEs. So the, the first three-manifold invariant uh, that uh, gives rise to floor homology was introduced in, in 1987 by, uh, by Floor. And um, it's the instance on floor homology, uh, and it's and now people are used to this sort of thing, but uh, so the Morse homology of the churn simons function on the space of SU2 connections, oops. Um, and um, the critical points of this churn simons functional are, are representations of the fundamental group. So, um, you know, that, that, that's sort of an, you know, as we'll see, each of the, these different floor homology theories, um, you know, as with any of these things, you know, this sort of basic Morse construction, you take something that you want to be a Morse function, so in this case, churn simons function, um, you look at its critical points, look at, and then make a uh, group generated by them and define a differential uh, using some, uh, using gradient trajectories. Um, so each of these different four homology theories picks up some different aspect of the geometry. So the initial one, the instanton floor homology, um, it's the aspect of the geometry was representations of the fundamental group. It was sensitive to the fundamental group. And 
then these are the major players in that development. The next one, which will be more important for us, is the Cyberguitin monopole floor homology, um, which uh, it comes in different, um, you know, so for the experts, I've decorated it properly, but I will just call it the Cyberguitin monopole floor homology. Um, um, so again, this is a, a Morse homology, but now it's for the chern simons dirac functional, which I'll write down later, on spin-C connections and spinners on a three-manifold. Um, and it, its history is a bit more murky. Um, it sort of, you know, <coughs> I mean, people had already seen several floor homologies by the time uh, the cyber whitney equations came along, so it was no surprise that there was an associated one and somehow, um, you know, there was a lot of work, not, uh, but now uh, Peter Kronheimer and I have, have written, you know, the, the Spanier version. So you can, I'm not sure that's good, right? But at least, you know, it's all there. Um, okay. Um, yeah, no, so like I said, there, there's some details which are important for general development of the theory, but we'll just focus on this one group. Um, okay, so these groups have a, um, you know, so I, it, I was a little, on the previous slide, I, I said I didn't pick a spin C structure, and I meant not to do that, but you could pick a spin C structure, and then the floor homology decomposes as, as a direct sum uh, according to spin C structures. Um, and the component, so then we want to think about the grading that'll be important later. Um, so each spin C structure, the component of, uh, belonging to a given spin C structure is graded by um, Z mod the divisibility of the um, first churn class of, sorry, that's, it should be K of C, sorry. Um, so in particular for a torsion class, it's Z graded, and for uh, classes which aren't torsion, well, it's Z mod, uh, whatever the divisibility of the class is. Okay, so um, now <clears throat> there's a, a, a kind of nice picture which you can, uh, maybe a, a tidier um, um, view of what the grading set is. So, I'm, since I'm not doing too bad on time, I will um, explain this a little bit more. So, you know, we're, we're interested in contact structures, so two plane fields. And a nice way to think about what, what the grading set here is, is that it's actually graded by homotopy classes of two plane fields. So, um, <laughs> if I have a, um, you know, so that's some discrete set. Now, if I have a, a <coughs> If I have my three manifold Y here, and um, I look at what I'm going to do. Yeah, I have a family of two planes. So um, <coughs> the so I have these two planes C. Then the first thing I can do, one thing I can do is I can associate to it uh, a spin C structure. So the spin C structure is one for which the spin bundle is the trivial bundle plus C. So of course you have to define Clifford multiplication on that, I won't do that, but there's a, a natural map which um, takes a, a two plane field, gives me a spin C structure, and um, if I take homotopic two plane fields then I get um, isomorphic spin C structures. So there's a natural map from this connected components of the space of sections there um, to uh, two spin C structures. Um, the other thing to notice is that, that there's on two plane fields on a, on a three manifold oriented two plane fields there's a natural Z action. So um, sections. 
And <laughs> the way it does so is that, it, of course, there's, um, there's a map, you know, if I look at pi 3 of S2, that's Z. And I think of that, um, you know, as, as a map actually from, as maps from the three ball rel boundary to uh, S2. Right? <coughs> so if I have a two plane field, I can modify it by excising a little three ball and, or th think of it, think of it as a vector field. So I think of this guy as a non-vanishing vector field that points in a given direction at the boundary. And I can construct a new vector field on my three manifold by picking a point. I already have a vector field pointing in a direction. I remove a ball. Then I put in this new vector field given by this map, which on the boundary points in the given direction. And so, so um, it, it's, um, you know, yeah. so there's a natural Z action on the space of um, two plane fields, which, um, um, what do I say? Right, which doesn't change the spin C structure. And that action is actually transitive on the, on the fibers of this map. Uh, the stabilizer is this, um, is the divisibility of this Euler class uh, times Z. So you, you get the same picture. I mean, as the, the grading set, you know, each of these guys was graded by either Z or Z mod this thing. So um, it's a, um, it allows you to state theorems a little bit more tidily to think about it that way. Okay. So cyber witten floor homology enjoys uh, many nice properties. Um, the one that's most important for the application to, to the Weinstein conjecture is that if the first churn class is torsion, then, um, sorry, I lost my pointer. Um, if the first churn class is torsion, then um, this monopole floor homology is, is a Z, it's already Z graded, we mentioned that. But it's finitely generated in any uh, degree. However, it's actually infinitely generated. There's, there are generators whose degree goes to plus infinity, but not minus infinity. So it sort of, if you will, goes up. Um, anyway, so that's, yeah. Um, there's, um, it, it also is a, the receptacle for a, a invariant of contact structures, which we'll call psi C, um, which actually lives in the, in the cohomology group. Um, so if I have a contact structure, I can associate a canonical element in the cyber witten floor cohomology. Um, it, it lives in the grading given by the two-plane field. So, um, and, oops, what I do? Yeah. And, right. Another uh, nice property that it has is that there are only finitely many cohomology classes, which are the first churn class of a spin C structure with the non-vanishing cyber written floor homology. It, and in fact, the first churn classes are uh, constrained by um, what Eliasberg likes to call the inequality. Um, so if I have an embedded oriented surface in, uh, in my three manifold, then um, these uh, this first churn class of the uh, spin C structure evaluated on the homology class has to, is a um, upper bound for the other characteristic provided that, that the surface is in a two sphere. And um, if you read the inequality, of course, every three manifold has embedded surfaces that represent homology class. So if you read the inequality uh, the other way, then um, this is actually constraining the first churn classes. They live inside uh, a certain um, polygon, which is the Thurston norm. And in fact, um, these groups in total determine the Thurston norm of the three manifold. Okay, so um, another I important theory, oops, I was gonna change that to plus. I changed my mind about which mono, Cyber witten for homology I was supposed to talk about. So, so these days, 
um, a lot of people know about Hagard floor homology and has become an important popular tool. Um, it, it's, um, its construction is, is actually comes from symplectic floor homology and, um, and just to indicate what kind of geometry it's feeling. So I didn't say what kind of geometry the monopole floor homology feels. Well, it feels solutions to the cyber Gwitten equation, which nobody except those who love it have any feeling for at all, you know? There's nothing, um, you know, what, what is the, you know, what does a harmonic spinner tell you, right? I mean, it tells you lots of things if you know enough, but it doesn't tell you anything that's evident geometric information. So um, the other homology theories do, so this, this guy tells us um, actually about something a little, little, um, you know, a little strange at first, but since it's so powerful, um, it's quite wonderful. So I take, uh, take a Morse function of my three manifold, which has one index three and one index zero critical points, and then G um, index one and two critical points. And, <coughs> and then I just look at G tuples of, uh, of flow lines that go from one and two be between the two and one dimension, two and one index critical points. Um, and um, I mention it because I was gonna state this conjecture, which I'm not stating incorrectly. Okay, I said the other one. I changed it there, good. Um, I, I, so this guy has some kind of evident, evident geometric meaning, just G tuples of these distinct flow lines. Um, and all evidence points to the fact that this guy is isomorphic to, um, to the monopole floor homology. Okay. Now, <coughs> the other character that plays a, a, a crucial role in the story is, is embedded contact homology. So this is defined by Hutchings and, you know, so, uh, Michael Hutchings defined the chain complex and then some joint work with Taubes, they proved that it actually was a chain complex, d squared is zero. So, I, I, so some people, um, you know, there's all these different definitions of floor homology and that, uh, some people have said that this is, uh, Michael's the proud inventor of absolutely the hardest one to prove that it exists. So, um, anyway, so there it is. So its definition involves a, choosing a contact structure. Um, so it's really at, at first an invariant of a three manifold with a contact structure. Um, it's related to symplectic field theory of Eliasberg, Hofer, and Gimenthal. Um, and the critical points, the geometry is exactly what we're interested in, periodic orbits of the Rabe vector field, except that it also, so the empty orbit. So, it's, you know, we're trying to prove existence of closed orbits, and this seems great. It's a homolo homology theory where the generators are involving periodic orbits, except that there's also the empty orbit. So, um, yeah, the differential is obtained from pseudo-holomorphic curves in, in the symplectization of the contact three manifold, which are asymptotic at the ends to, to Rabe orbits. So, right. <coughs> now, um, actually you can turn, you know, nothing into something um, because um, this empty orbit always defines a, a cycle. It can't be hit by any differential if you think about the definition. Um, and uh, so, <coughs> I'm sorry, it, well, depending on where you think it lives. Um, okay, so um, there has this canonical element and th these groups have a decomposition according to the homology class of the periodic orbit that you, of the union of orbits that you're studying. So, uh, so this is starting to look like 
the monopole floor homology. Um, so, so this is clearly a, a good invariant for addressing the Weinstein conjecture. So a, a manifold that has no periodic, no closed ray orbits, we know what the embedded contact homology is. There's exactly one generator. It's the empty orbit. So that's a complex that everybody can compute the homology of. The complex is Z with no differential. Um, so the embedded contact homology is isomorphic, this guy, just Z. Um, right. And it, we can use this decomposition of the homology classes to say that, um, well, if we can't write, you know, if, it, it's, if it's impossible to write a homology class as a positive sum of oriented orbits, then the embedded contact homology for that homology class is zero, unless gamma is zero, in which case we get z. Um, yeah. So an, another thing that you can say is that if, so if this uh, distinguished class is zero, then there have to be closed orbits because there had to have been some differential that hits it, so there had to be some other ray orbit um, that uh, that kills it. I, I, I said that I should set it backwards. It, it, it can't. This guy can't hit anything. It's in the kernel of D. Um, it might be in the image, but if it's in the image, it, there has to be another closed orbit. So. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, Taub's proof of the Weinstein conjecture um, actually contains the seeds of the proof of a more general result, which is that actually there's, if I fix a contact one form, there's an isomorphism from the embedded contact homology to the, the cyber witten floor homology. Um, and in fact, um, <coughs> I wouldn't give this conjecture as a problem to any of your students because I know Cliff is working on it and has a bunch of papers that are going to come out soon. So, you know, the, the original proof, um, so I'm going to pretend that this is true for expository reasons. It's easier to see how the things I said about monopole floor homology um, imply the existence of closed orbits and uh, just assuming that this this conjecture is true, but in fact, the, everything that I'm going to say has already been proved without using the full strength of the isomorphism, just sort of um, going, you know. Well, if you pick, um, if you pick a, it involves choosing a contact one form. So it's, um, you know. So given a contact one form, there is one isomorphism that you can produce. Yeah. No other choice. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm used to questions like that by now, you know. It's OK. Um, so under the decompos decomposition of ECH, oops, that's still a typo. This is supposed to be the same group. Sorry. Um, that's what it was, you know, yesterday. Um, anyway, um, so these are both graded, and um, yeah, uh, by well, yeah, sorry, right. What I want to say, <coughs> um, right. So, um, so this is this has a decomposition. According to homology class, this has um, a decomposition according to spin C structures. Those correspond by taking a homology class um, and then sending it to the spin C structure coming from the contact plane tensored with the Poincare dual of gamma. So I think of the Poincare dual as a, instead of as a cohomology class, I think of it as a line bundle and uh, complex line bundle and complex line bundles act on spin C structures. So that's a, a natural way for things to work out. Um, and the canonical element is mapped to the contact invariant. Oops. So, um, so, 
Yeah, so from what I said about the cyber Gwitten floor homology, for any contact three manifold, um, <coughs> this, uh, this group is infinitely generated if um, this uh, Poincare dual of gamma plus k c is a torsion class. So, um, so this proves that. That, that part proves the Weinstein conjecture, right? This, we know that the monopole floor homology um, for uh, spin C structure with this class torsion um, is, um, is infinitely generated. So this group is infinitely generated. In particular, it can't be Z. So, um, so that, that's sort of the um, mechanism for the proof. And it, it sort of it, you know, exhibits the principle that just there's not enough room to have different floor homology theories. You do completely different constructions and they end up with isomorphic groups and that the fact that they're isomorphic tells you wonderful things. Um, okay, so just to put this in some context, there's a, there, there are lots of results about, um, you know, lots of general results about when uh, periodic orbits exist. So one, so Sort of important results of Hoffer in, from the um, <laughs> yeah ninety three sorry um, so if either Y is a covering of S three or the three manifold is um, reducible at pi two of the three manifold is non zero then um, then every ray vector field admits a uh, closed orbit. Um, and uh, more recently, Abbas, Chilabak, and Hoffer proved that if C is supported by a planar open book, I won't define what that is, but you know, it, it sort of a general property that a contact structure can have, then uh, all rabe flows have, um, have closed orbits. So, but, so the, these you know, results don't get you that far. Um, Okay, yeah, how am I doing on time? All right, I think I will. So you can say, um, sorry. I just wanna say, I wanna basically ignore this slide, but you can say something about um, over-twisted contact structures also using these results. So over-twisted means that there's an embedded disk um, so that its boundary is tangent to the contact plane field. So, um, yeah, I don't want to explain that. Um, anyway, so uh, there's a, uh, you know, another theorem of Hoffer's says that if you have an over-twisted contact structure, there's a, a, null, homolog a null homotopic closed ray orbit. Um, what you can prove um, in, in this context using this isomorphism is that there's a null homologous closed ray orbit for every um, every over twisted contact structure. That's because the contact invariant, this H of xi, is is zero for an over twisted contact structure, and so there had to be something that that kills it. Anyway, um, okay. So where's the beef? Uh, so. <coughs> How do you get at this isomorphism? Why should these things uh, be related? So I'll explain a little bit about this. So now let's fix a spin C structure and there's its spin bundle. And for this discussion, let's assume that the first churn class is torsion. Um, and here rho is Clifford multiplication. And uh, we'll let A denote a typical spin C connection and phi uh, typical spinner, a section of this bundle W. Um, so so the, the spin bundle is a rank two bundle and um, I think my battery is dying. Yeah, okay. Um, there we go. Yeah, so W is a rank two bundle and then uh, the connection A, that's a connection in W, induces a connection which we'll call A hat in the determinant. Um, and the Cyber-Gwitten equations, 
there are equations for this pair A and phi, and uh, these are the three-dimensional cyber Gwitten equations. The first one says that, well, this, this is a, an imaginary two form. I take its Hodge star, that's an imaginary one form. I look at how it acts by Clifford multiplication. It acts by a traceless self-adjoint endomorphism, and the spinner phi gives me another traceless self-adjoint endomorphism by looking at the rank one endomorphism, you know, uh, that a vector in a norm vector space naturally gives me and taking its traceless part. So I equate these two guys uh, and I ask that the spinner be harmonic with respect to the spin connection. So those are the cyber Gwitten equations. Um, and these are the Euler Lagrange equations for Chern Simons Dirac function, which I'm, I'm going to write down now. Um, we have to fix a, a base connection to define the Chern Simons Dirac functional, and I'll assume that connection, um, because this guy's torsion, I can assume that connection's flat, and I'll do that. Um, so any spin connection can be written as this base connection plus an imaginary one form times the identity on W. Um, so this is a one form with values in endomorphisms of, I mean, thinking, thinking of this guy as a one form with values in endomorphisms of W. And the configuration space, again, is uh, now imaginary one forms by this identification and sections of W. And it's called C for configuration. Um, the chern simons dirac functional is, um, is this uh, function of the pair, which integrates A wedge D A. Um, sorry. The, the contact one form henceforth is called lambda, and A is a different one form from before. Sorry about that. Um, OK, so it's this A wedge DA plus uh, phi inner product DA of phi. So this is, um, you know, first term is just a churn Simons of, of A, and then there's this Dirac term. And we're going to fix a metric compatible with a contact one form lambda, which means um, I want star of d lambda to be uh, 2 lambda. Um, now, given the contact structure, I can uh, perturb these equations. Well, I can perturb the, the functional. Here's how, how I'm going to perturb the functional. There's a turn Simons Dirac sub r, which includes an extra term involving the contact one form, and for uh, reasons of, of um, you know, kind of scaling, it's convenient to also scale this term. That's a little less. Uh, I, can, I can always uh, absorb the r in what I call phi, but I'll, I'll choose to write it this way. Um, so, <coughs> um, yeah, so what tabs, Right, so, sorry, I need to, this term I, I'm going to call E of A, that's kind of an energy that I'm, that's going to be important. That's the turn Simons, and then there's the Dirac term. And what Taub's that is a study, study the large R behavior of um, the critical point set of this, um, I mean, of the chain complex that defines the cyber Gwitten four homology groups. So, um, yeah, now, um, there's a, a gauge group that acts on C, preserving solutions to the equations. And this group acts freely on this subset where the spinner uh, doesn't identically vanish. And we'll call these the irreducible configurations. It acts with stabilizer, the constant maps, so S1, on the subset of reducible guys where the, the spinner vanishes identically. Um, now, um, the quotient space, um, yeah, so I, I want to explain I, in a few words why it is that, that the, these groups are infinitely generated. So at first, it seems like that's not going to happen because um, there's a compactness theorem. The solutions to the cyber Gwitten equations once I divide out by the action of the gauge group is compact. And 
in fact, if we perturb them properly, um, I, I've ignored the perturbations of the equations here, um, there are finitely many distinct orbits of solutions to the perturbed equations. So remember, in, in Morse homology, I take the critical points um, and I construct a chain complex from those guys. So this certainly doesn't look like it's going to be infinitely generated. But the issue is here that um, there are reducible critical points. So there's, this is, we're, we're trying to do sort of Morse theory on a space, if you will, with an S1 action. The S1 action has fixed points, and the fixed points are, have to be treated um, in, a, in a different way. And each fixed point, in fact, um, it, it, when, uh, when you sort it out properly, each fixed point contributes infinitely many generators, which you can think of it like as the homology of CP infinity, the homotopy quotient of a point. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's sort of, that, that's why in a torsion case, um, the complex, yeah, so just re-saying what I said. Um, so uh, in the torsion case, torsion C1 case, there are infinitely many generators for the complex. Um, now, the uh, next point is uh, relative, yeah, so we want, want these groups to be graded. And the, the grading is given by uh, the spectral flow of the Hessian of Chern-Simons Dirac. So you know, in finite dimensional Morse theory, um, the dimension of the, the moduli space, or you know, the moduli space of flow lines between two critical points is the difference in the Morse indices. In the infinite dimensional case, there's no, um, you know, As, as many of you are familiar with already, but in, in the infinite dimensional context for something like the chern simons dirac functional and symplectic action functional, those sorts of things, um, the Hessian is a first order operator. It has infinitely many uh, positive and negative eigenvalues. So here's the spectrum of this self-adjoint operator, Hessian of CSD. <coughs> um, this is zero, and um, so at, at a configuration um, C, right? Now if I have another configuration, I can look at the spectrum of the Hessian there. There it is. <coughs> and um, there isn't a notion of, you know, Morse index, which would be the number of negative eigenvalues, but I can talk about the difference of the Morse indices um, by joining up um, these paths. I'm joining up these, uh, you know, I find a path CT um, that goes in one direction to C and the other direction to C prime. I watch what happens to the spectrum. It flows and I look at how many times it crosses um, it crosses zero, that's the spectral flow. Um, so the spectral flow gives me the, the grading difference. That's, that's going to be important. Um, yeah, so here, here I, finally, I finally am writing down the perturbed equations for you. So without the red, that was the old equations. With the red, um, that's, what, that's what the new uh, equations that we're trying to study, that's what they look like. Um, and um, if I look, at, so remember, my spin bundle is a rank two bundle. I can Clifford multiply by this um, uh, contact one form, and that decomposes um, my Clifford bundle into, uh, into a sum of line bundles, which um, <coughs> I, I will call uh, L and L tensor the, the canonical bundle of C. Um, so res with respect to this decomposition, I can write a typical spinner in, in terms of its components, alpha and beta. And these equations then become equations for, um, <coughs> for this triple, A, uh, alpha, and beta. And, oops, I, I lost an I here, but um, 
but the, the curvature equation, um, I can write in two components. So this is, you know, this, if you like, is an equation. I can think of this as an equation uh, for one forms on my three manifold. And the one forms given this non-vanishing one form lambda, I can decompose into a component along lambda where it looks like this and a component orthogonal to lambda where it looks like this. So these guys are, um, you know, if you look at vortex equations, um, it's quite similar to that. And the, we still want, you know, this guy to be a harmonic spinner. Okay, so th this is what the equations look like. And we're trying to study what happens as R goes to infinity in, in these equations. So um, what, uh, sorry, I should, um, go back. So actually, our, our, our um, base connection is flat, so this term shouldn't be here. Uh, it, that would be what it, you know, if I wrote down a story in general, I, I'd have to worry about this term. Imagine it's not there. Um, if, if I integrate this equation over the three manifold, then this term is basically this E of A that I wrote down before. So E of A was the integral of, of uh, lambda against, um, uh, um, against dA. So this, if I integrate this guy, or, you know, maybe wedge with, uh, I don't know what say, this a, yeah, oh, this is a function, so I can integrate, yeah. Um, <coughs> I mean, so I can integrate this, and that, that gives me this energy, and um, what you, um, E of A in the functional, and um, what, um, so if I look at the other side of the equations, there was uh, a term that was one minus alpha squared plus beta squared. So one of the first things that you prove is that as you perturb the equations, the beta tries to go to zero. So basically what, um, what this E of A is doing is, is controlling this um, trying to control this term. And uh, the sort of next basic result is that if I have a sequence of solutions to these equations where the parameter, sorry, uh, corresponding parameter values are i, should be some kind of comma there, period, some kind of punctuation, um, with the property that this e remains bounded while the parameters ri are going to infinity, then um, after passing to a subsequence, the inverse image of zero, the zero set of the alpha spinner correspond, uh, converges to a union of closed ray orbits. So that's, that's sort of where the ray orbit comes from, is this uh, spinner that's this, you know, component in the line bundle L of the spinner. Um, okay, so, oops. So I want to say, um, so it's important to get a control over that E of A. That's the game now. Um, and this is similar to the strategy that, that uh, Taubes used in his work on uh, equating cyber witten and Gromov invariance. But there's a, a very important difference that makes it much harder, which is that um, the analogous quantity, um, you know, so somehow what the E of A, what we want to control is basically lambda wedge the curvature of the spin connection. Um, what was important to control in the dimension, four dimensional case is this pairing, the integral of the symplectic form against the self dual part of some you know, curvature related thing. And this was cohomological. So the, in the four dimensional case, just the, um, you know, the structure of the equations is so rigid that the crucial thing that you need to control is, is fixed. So you win. I mean, it's still, don't, don't get me wrong, it's a huge amount of work to go from this trivial equality to prove that there exists a pseudo-holomorphic curve. That's what you need to do in the four-dimensional case. But, um, but the first step uh, was straightforward. So, <coughs> well, um, the contact 
one form isn't closed, um, the integral of lambda times the curvature, that's no longer a cohomological thing. It just changes as I change A. So, um, yeah. Anyway, so that's, that's that. So, um, so to get past this lack of control, there were two important ideas that, um, that Taub's considered. So, um, so we're trying to, con uh, yeah, trying to understand the large R behavior of, um, of this E. Um, so what he looked at is sort of what you might call the homological spectrum of the Chern-Simons Dirac functional. So that is, if I look at a, I look at a homology class, I look at all of its representatives, and I, I look at uh, the minimum over all representatives of the value of this Chern-Simons Dirac function. Right. Um, so that is, you know, I, I look at, uh, I look at this representative, so these are critical points of the Chern-Simons Dirac functional. These are integers, the ends. Um, and I look amongst all C's that appear in a non-trivial way in a, a representative, sorry, uh, that's supposed to be NC. I mean, you know, so I write this class delta as a sum um, where the component's non-zero, and I look at the one that has minimal uh, energy relative or mi minimal Chern-Simons Dirac functional. And um, so if you like, uh, you know, so in the analogy in Morse theory is that, um, you know, if I, if I have a Morse function, then there's an energy filtration of the homology. I look at the homology of the sublevel sets as I go higher and higher. And what this, uh, what this uh, number is measuring is the first time, or maybe not the first time, but the la last time that um, as I, you know, the last time that a, a given homology class appears in the homology of a sublevel set, as I raise the, you know, it appears and then it stays forever. If it appears and disappears, that doesn't count. But if it appears and stays forever, then that's what this, um, what this number is measuring. And the other thing, well, the thing that we really need to control is this E. Uh, of R, which is now the minimum same kind of deal, but now uh, over, I want C to be minimum of this energy over C's that satisfy, um, you know, that realize the minimum. So the <coughs> uh, miracle that happens here is that actually if you, I mean, it's somehow not too hard, but it, it, if you just stare at some natural differential inequalities that these guys satisfied, as you, you know, I, I imagine following along a critical point, um, which, you know, for a little while it'll, it'll move along as a function of R, and then I differentiate, um, you know, oops, where's the button, there's the button. I differentiate this guy as a function, or, you know, maybe more precisely this guy as a function of R, and um, should, and this guy is a function of R, and I see that their derivatives are related, and I can make some interesting manipulations. And at the end of the day, what you prove is that if you have a sequence where this guy is going to infinity, then the Chern-Simons, not Chern-Simons direct, but Chern-Simons of this guy um, goes to infinity quadratically in R. So, you know, it takes some, takes some work to prove that, but that's, that's somehow, you know, the, the equations have some amazing structure which allows you to, to, to prove that. There's just saying it again. Um, <coughs> the second idea is an um, asymptotic estimate of spectral flow. So, so this estimate says that uh, spectral flow of a family of Dirac operators coupled to a path of connections is to leading order given by the change in the churn simons invariant between the connections. So that is, um, <coughs> you know, so I, we have the spectral flow over there, 
And um, if I have uh, a path of, you know, so I look at Dirac operators coupled to a path of connections, then, um, yeah, then, um, then you can estimate the spectral flow by the churn simons invariant plus some terms that are, are s smaller size in terms of the curvature of the uh, curvature and derivatives of the curvature. So what that implies, um, yeah, right. So this has an implication for solutions to cyber Witten equations. So the, there's some, I, I don't want to state the precise relation here. It's a little complicated to write down, but um, it, if I look at paths that arise from solutions to the cyber Witten equations, then, um, then what I find is that the spectral flow uh, of the this Hessian of churn simons is equal to um, the change in the churn simons invariant plus a term that's little o of r squared. Um, and what that tells you is that, remember, um, this is telling you the grading difference, this spectral flow. This term is glowing quadratically in R, um, and this term can't kill it. It's too small. So that's telling you that the only way you can have a sequence where the energy is going off to infinity is if actually the, the grading of the class is going off to infinity. Well, if we look at, if we have a non-trivial class in a fixed grading, that can't happen. The energy must be bounded. You get a closed, closed orbit. And I will close on that orbit. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for the talk. Does uh, anyone have any questions? You had a wonderful analogy that lets me frame a question. So before Eilenberg's keynote, actually, everybody had brother at a and after, you had things like the flight level, whatever, you could prove that you have to prolong the things the whole groups are in the market. So pursuing the analogy, there's everybody and their brother now has a four homology theory. Uh, I don't, there isn't a uniqueness theorem like this, but if somebody proves some of the Hutchings conjecture, are there basic tools that would be analogous to something like the five lum or something like that, and, and say axioms and say, well, if you have something that behaves like this, then it'll give you isomorphic four homology groups. I mean, it, it, you know, of course, a lot of people are thinking about things like that, but there's nothing that's, you know, certainly you know, all, the, all the proofs that these days that two floor homology theories are isomorphic are pretty brutal. And this is another brutal proof. I mean, they really, you know, showing that in some situations you can identify the, the chain complexes, basically. And um, it, it would be good to find more conceptual proofs. I mean, it's not, you know, well, not clear. But to do it. Sense, nobody would care about the Ellenberg Steenrod axioms unless you had basic consequences of them that were really easy to like, like the uniqueness of a cohomology theory or something like that. So it'd be nice to have axioms that were that nice. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I think it'll be much longer. <laughs> Is there anyone else? No. Well, uh, we'll thank Tom again.